uh, very uh, smoothly. Now, it's 10 minutes after 8 o'clock. We now go into a Kickstarter discussion, labor externalization deals, and what is happening in that particular docket. I do have uh, the head of uh, labor externalization in the Ministry of Gender, Labor, and uh, Social Development uh, joining us uh, this morning. I will be introducing him officially a little bit later. Let me just give you a preamble to our discussion. Uganda renewed the bilateral labor agreement it entered into with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for the export of uh, domestic labor to the Gulf country that has been described as strict but with better terms in months after suspending the agreement by Uganda over what was described as continuous mistreatment and torture of migrant workers, you, the two countries historically have enjoyed warm relations and were able to sit on one table and of course iron this out. The Ministry of Gender says 150,000 Ugandans are earning a livelihood in Saudi Arabia annually and that those living and working in the Middle East are sending home a staggering $700 million annually. So Mr. Hilary Atalemwa, the head of labor externalization in the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development is joining us this morning to help us understand what is the state of affairs when it comes to the deals or agreements that are reached between Uganda and uh, Saudi Arabia, but also other countries in the Middle East when it comes to exportation of uh, labor. A very good morning, Mr. Talema. Uh, good morning. How are we doing? I'm good, and uh, good morning to the viewers. Great. Let me get this underway by giving you an opportunity first and foremost to bring us up to speed with the latest uh, when it comes to the agreements that have been signed between uh, the government of Uganda and uh, Saudi Arabia, but also other countries within the Middle East when it comes to externalization of uh, labor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe to give a background, mm. on a spe specifically on the agreement with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. Yeah, like you have rightly stated, uh, in 2017, the government of Uganda uh, signed an agreement for labor externalization with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, the agreement uh, uh, could renew automatically after mm. five years, mm. uh, but government uh, took a decision uh, not to allow it uh, to renew automatically uh, because of the several issues. Uh, I guess uh, you know um, those issues. There was there were outcries mm. uh, within the public of the challenges, especially of the domestic workers. Uh, so in December, we exercised that option of not having the agreement renewed. Otherwise, there was an option to have mm. it renewed mm. uh, the way. And that would mean the, the status quo would remain. So then we invoked that provision, uh, we started negotiations so that these challenges that were coming out of the migrant workers from Kingdom of Saudi Arabia could mm -hmm. be addressed. So I will issue a notice to the, uh, the other government and a notice was for 60 days. We commenced negotiations uh, on the revised agreement. We had hoped that by 23rd uh, of February this year, the negotiations would be complete, but they were not. Uh, they, I must say they were protracted negotiations because mm. of the issues at hand. Mm. So on 23rd, the agreement expired. Then again, we continued with the nego negotiations until uh, they were concluded, uh, which culminated into the signing of the new agreement uh, on the 29th uh, of March uh, uh, this year. All right. So, so that, uh, uh, that is for Kingdom of Kingdom Saudi, Arabia. Saudi Arabia. I also asked about other agreements. Mm -hmm. uh, we have signed a memorandum of understanding mm. uh, with the uh, government of United Arab Emirates, mm -hmm. uh, but this agreement hasn't been implemented yet uh, because of some technical uh, developments which are supposed to take place before it comes into force. Okay. But uh, the ministry is following uh, it up with the, res the, the responsible, the counterpart in the other side to have it uh, given effect. We also negotiated and finalized uh, a labor agreement with the state of Qatar. Mm. However, it's not yet signed, but it's due for signing. Mm. And arrangements are underway to have it signed soon. 
Uh, negotiations are going on with other countries, Kuwait, uh, Bahrain. Uh, they also, the ministry uh, intends to go beyond the Middle East, mm. negotiate uh, the agreements with Canada, UK, okay. and Turkey. Now, the viewer out there would want to specifically be brought up to speed with what is the content of the agreement. For example, what is agreed on? For example, on pay, is mm. there something like a minimum wage? What is agreed on when it comes to the conduct of uh, companies that are mm. responsible for taking many of these uh, young boys and girls? What happens to the safeguards in place, especially when it comes to holding of documents when mm. these uh, <coughs> young boys, young men and women reach these countries? Because those appear to be the bone of contention many times when it, stories come up of uh, harsh treatment or even in worst case scenarios death and sickness yeah uh, i think maybe to of course we cannot uh, unpack the entire agreement on mm. this show yeah. but maybe to give the highlights that's uh, right some of the <coughs> issues we negotiated one was that uh, both parties are supposed to establish mechanisms to ensure that the welfare and the challenges of uh, migrant workers, domestic workers, are addressed. Mm. Uh, you'll, you'll recall that there have been challenges where um, when domestic workers face anything they face in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, they have no redress mechanisms. It all comes back here. It's the uh, Minister of Gender, Minister of Foreign Affairs, the recruitment agencies which took these people. Mm. So want even the government, the other side, to put in place redress mechanisms. Then the two governments must regulate recruitment costs. Uh, you must have heard the, the, the concerns of the public, how companies are collecting a lot of money, people are selling land, people are selling all their properties. Yeah. Uh, just go and work and earn a salary, maybe of one equivalent of one million or 900,000. Yeah. So in this agreement, we have agreed that both parties, that the two governments, should regulate and control recruitment costs. Mm. For instance, in the case of domestic workers, domestic workers are not supposed to pay any penny. Mm. The process should be free for them. Then, we'll, like you rightly stated, no salary deduction. We have also had in the past cases of someone is supposed to be earning equivalent maybe of one million, but there are deductions, mm. you no know, arbitrary deductions. Uh, someone ends up maybe with to 400, equivalent of 400,000, yet they are earning equivalent of 1 million. So it's now a responsibility of both governments to ensure that such uh, deductions do not occur. Then also that the two governments are supposed to ensure that the migrant workers have recourse to judicial or competent authorities. Mm. For instance, if there are a breach of labor laws, the domestic workers in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia should have recourse to the judicial systems to get justice. Mm. Not come here and then we start uh, pressing the recruitment agencies, yet they are not in control of whatever is happening on the other side. Then also the both governments are supposed to put in place measures uh, to, to sanction recruitment agencies on either side which mm. violate the rules, the laws, rules and regulations of labor externalization. The companies here, uh, the ministry should be able to bring them to book in accordance with the laws. Equally, the recruitment agencies in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia mm. uh, should be able to be brought uh, to book by the government the other side, uh, not to leave the migrant workers on their own. Then also the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, is supposed to ensure that employers respect the contracts of domestic workers. Mm. That too has been previously a challenge. Uh, the contract is, yes, the contract has good provisions, but the when it reaches the other side, the employers uh, tear it in mm. two pieces. So we have obligated the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia government uh, to ensure that employers uh, respect contracts and whoever doesn't, uh, they, they sanction them. Then also, there have been also cases of transfer, 
someone lives here has signed a contract mm. with X, they reach there, it maybe works for X for two months or even a week, then perhaps the employer uh, may feel they don't need this person, they transfer to another person. Remember, this contract is a four-party contract mm. signed by the employer, employee, the recruitment agency here, and the recruitment agents in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. But the employer, on their own wish, they just transfer. So that has also been catered for. For there to be a transfer, the two recruitment agencies, both here in Uganda and Saudi Arabia, must be in the process. So that there is traceability of mm. the domestic worker. Then also there has been renewal. The contracts are two years. Mm. After two years, either by consent or forceful consent, or even without consent, some of them have been renewing their contracts and they remain there after two years. Mm. The company, the recruitment agency here, doesn't know where a particular uh, migrant worker is. The ministry does not know, but the parents know that it's company X mm. which took this person. Yet the company is saying the contract was two years and the contract ended, I'm not responsible. So in the negotiations we had, we have uh, put an obligation that for there to be a renewal of contract, our embassy in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia must approve that renewal. Mm. And the recruitment agency here and the recruitment agency in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia must be informed so that there is traceability of this person and the, uh, the government and the recruitment agencies are still responsible for this person. Okay. Then also integration of our systems. Mm. Uh, the Saudi Arabia, they have a system of migrant migration of labor. It's called the Msaned system. It is linked to their visa system. We also have an external employment management system, uh, the one we use to manage this uh, migration process. So we also agreed that we integrate these systems so that there is a sharing of information, data management, also traceability. We are able to monitor the movement of a, a migrant worker from mm. Uganda to Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and also monitor them throughout the service of their contracts if these two systems are integrated. Then also, of course, the joint the major challenge we had from the previous contract was enforcement. Mm. The reason was, while the agreement provided for constitution of a joint technical committee, the committee was never constituted throughout mm. the entire five years. So under this arrangement, the new arrangement, uh, we put a timeline. The agreement was signed on 29th March. Within two months, we are each government is supposed to constitute members to the Joint Technical Committee. That committee is the one that will be responsible for what I would call the monitoring and evaluation of the implementation of this contract, of this agreement, mm. and address the challenges that may arise in the implementation. All right. That's quite elaborate, and uh, thank you very much. Now, there is what is widely believed to be Uganda's lack of bargaining power, mm. well, especially when it comes to setting the terms and conditions that are favorable to Uganda as a country and especially to these uh, young boys and girls that go to seek uh, jobs and, uh, of course, a greener pasture right there. You talk about the fact that mechanisms are put in place on the other side and this mm. side, but mm. our concern as a country is mainly what mechanisms and how effective are they the other side, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to safeguarding these young boys and girls. We've had issues of Ugandans dying, Ugandans mm -hmm. getting sick, others being deported. But when they were legally taken to mm -hmm. the Middle East, there are cases where it is illegal. But that doesn't mean we won't discuss them because they reach mm -hmm. there legally. There must be a national a strategy to ensure that every Ugandan, whether it's mm -hmm. in any country legally or otherwise, they should be able to be uh, to get help. But for these particular ones, when we hear cases of uh, boys and girls dying and then repatriation of their remains is a trauma for the family in itself, what is the Ministry of uh, Labor's stand on this? Uh, thank you. 
Of course, it's also important to note mm. uh, death per se, it shouldn't be an issue. Mm. But because people die anyway. Yeah. Even the handling yeah, yes, after even death people is what? Yeah, die. Yeah. So what should be of concern is perhaps the circumstances that lead to the death. Mm -hmm. And then after death, how, uh, how is the process handled? How is there justice, uh, the remains of the deceased repatriated? Yes, we have had a challenge eh, of where uh, someone dies and then repatriation becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. But that has been a case. We have cases where some of our people, when they go there to work, they run away. They, we call them runaways. Mm. They, so by law, a person who runs away, you have breached a contract. Mm. So while under the contract, the employer is obligated in the case of death to repatriate the remains of the deceased migrant worker. Mm. If the migrant worker at the time of death had ran away, the employer is not obligated. So that's where we have had the challenges of forth and back movements, the recruitment mm. agent saying I'm not obligated, he or she had breached. Then the ministry is saying, but you are the one, who, the relatives are saying you are the one who took this person. So, but we have in this under the standard contract, the employer is responsible for the repatriation of the remains, and even the foreign recruitment agency is, mm. is, has that responsibility on behalf of the employer, the other side. So, what now we, we had to address is in the case of runaway, mm. uh, who is responsible? So still the obligation is on the government of Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, mm. okay. uh, where there is a runaway, it's obligation of the government. Of course, the ministry overall remain with obligation of enforcing and making sure that in where there is death, the remains are returned. All right. Maybe also you had talked of the mm. bargaining power the bargaining now. Bar, yeah. Yes, but right. Uh, of course, we are not at uh, the same footing uh, with the countries in the Arab world. Mm. But what is important is to have mechanisms. If you don't have mechanisms of your own, for instance, I will give you the example of the Philippines. You know, it's a case study. Mm. Uh, Philippines has invested in mechanisms beyond the destination government. They have their own structures mm. in the destination countries where they take their migrant workers. So now it's upon us as government to also invest in mechanisms or structures mm. beyond the governments of the destination countries. Uh, for instance, deploy labor touches like now in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, mm. Philippines, they have over 90 labor officers with offices in all cities of Saudi Arabia, but on our side you find that we have only the embassy, you know Saudi mm. Arabia is a diverse country. Very diverse indeed. Then you have an embassy of five staff, maybe with one person in charge of labor issues. So as government, uh, the, the steps forward are to invest beyond the structures of the destination countries okay. have our own systems. All right. I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap this up. I'll allow you to do that. And also uh, perhaps uh, give us a snippet into efforts to ensure that what we export in terms of uh, the quality of the labor, is it, yeah. is, is it structured is, or rather is it clustered, for example, uh, housemaids or domestic workers, and then they are the skilled Mm. you know people uh, do we have clusters when it comes to the how and the who is going yeah we have but you'll note that largely we have had mainly semi-skilled and non-skilled mm. mm. uh, but we even with kingdom of saudi arabia there is a new initiative which uh, is coming up where uh, we are going to start uh, we have start also externalizing uh, profession skilled uh, professionals mm. Uh, that's in the pipeline. Then also to negotiate with other countries for professional jobs, like ke our f colleagues in Kenya negotiated an agreement with UK for nurses. So mm. we also want to take that route, okay. Canada and, and Turkey. So that we, because Middle East, it's largely the non-skilled and uh, semi-skilled. But the ultimate goal is also to bring, to have bigger numbers in, in the professional or skilled labor.
But maybe to sum it up, mm. uh, us as government, we need to invest more. Uh, a lot of money, this sector brings in more money than any other sector, including uh, the famous coffee. But when you look at what... How much money are we looking at? Uh, from the Gulf countries alone, mm. uh, one billion US dollars annually. So then of, of that, 700 million is from only Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So, if we invest more in this sector, perhaps you will streamline, put in place structures, especially in the destination countries, mm. so that we encourage more. Or of course, government, the ultimate goal cannot be to take people abroad. The ultimate goal is for people to have employment at home. But as we reach, we move towards that, mm. there is this reactionary, you know, people will still go anyway. So how do uh, you benefit from that? Okay, I've just received uh, information here on my uh, Twitter. There is uh, an aspect that we still have to cover, but... <coughs> we're going to have to uh, pay attention to the dynamics of uh, broadcasting. So we shall go for a break and uh, return. Then we shall use uh, a few minutes to do the wrap and also tackle the issue that has been uh, just communicated by one of the stakeholders in labor externalization sector. St stay with us. Welcome back from that break. We are discussing the new labor externaliza externalization deal, I must emphasize, that is between Uganda and the Kingdom of uh, Saudi Arabia with regard to exportation of uh, domestic workers to the Gulf country. Uh, $700 million is the money that Uganda uh, cruise from uh, this arrangement and uh, that's a staggering sum and of course uh, if you ha we were not with us before we went to the break Mr. Hilary Talema the head of uh, labor externalization said that Uganda can actually make a lot more in this does that mean exportation of labor should be widely accepted as a strategy no you should be able to create enough jobs within a country uh, to be able to uh, of uh, the young boys and girls, men and women, the opportunities that they do deserve. But the circumstances across the globe are different, and of course uh, every country uh, grapples with its own in a unique way. So for now, for those that can't get jobs within the country's uh, labor system, an opportunity is there to go and work elsewhere. And that's why some of these deals are being uh, uh, threshed out to ensure that there is fairness for all. Let me return to uh, Mr. Hillary Taleba and uh, go into the specifics of uh, the companies that are licensed and thereby mandated to be able to take Ugandans out. There is a lot of confusion in there, including fraud and human trafficking. Lines must be drawn by the regulators and the government when it comes to licensing these companies. I know every arrangement has its own fault. Mm -hmm. You cannot be 100% effective in ensuring that those that uh, intend to take advantage of the market uh, come on board. But what exactly is being done to ensure this is minimized and that cases of trafficking and fraudsters having their day is uh, completely halted? Uh, thank you. Yeah, rightly you have said uh, there is a lot of fraud I in this sector. There are many uh, fake companies, but the ministry licensed companies and the licensing process is a vigorous one. Mm. Uh, it even involves vetting of these directors of these companies by the internal security uh, organization. So the, the process, the licensing process is a vigorous process so that uh, the unscrupulous characters uh, they do not end up in this sector. However, uh, of course, uh, government, like any, any government agencies, uh, you face a challenge of enforcement. Mm. Uh, <coughs> so we, uh, we have had a challenge of enforcement. There are many companies which are not licensed, uh, which are operating, charging exorbitant fees, uh, some trafficking, even some of those that are licensed are charging exorbitant fees. So now uh, we have uh, initiated programs to sensitize the public and then also to, to ask for more manpower to be on ground. Mm. I think if you live in Kampara, every five, uh, five meters you turn, there is a signpost of a recruitment yeah. agency and so on. Majority of these are not licensed. Uh, we don't, the public may not be able to 
tell which one is licensed or not. But the ministry has come up with a system, an online system. The, yeah. These companies are licensed uh, on external uh, employment management system. Uh, there is a website where the list of all those companies which are duly licensed is uh, the public can go to that website. Also, we encourage the public that before you deal with any company, any recruitment agency, mm. first identify <coughs> whether that company is duly li licensed. Of course, not everyone will access the ministry, but we have structures at local or government level. We have labor officers. The RDCs have the lists of those duly licensed companies. And the labor officers have said, those who can access the web, say, ministry website, uh, they can also have access. So we encourage Ugandans that before you deal with any recruitment agency, first establish its status. Even when you have established its status, if you, they have offered a job, is that job does that job order exist? So the ministry also approved those job orders, mm. and the approved job orders are published on the website, the valid job orders uh, in respect of uh, different countries. Uh, we also uh, periodically publish the, that list of those licensed companies mm. to update the public, to know which agencies to deal with, and so on. Okay, but uh, then also we have strict sanctions. If any company which is duly licensed is mm. involved in a breach of the terms of their licenses, their licenses are revoked, like extortion, human trafficking, and so on. Interesting, there, eh? because uh, the stories of uh, companies continuing to do business are awash, and uh, from our findings, uh, on the journalistic uh, point of view, is that many of these companies either have. Uh, very powerful individuals as uh, trustees or m on their boards or even direct owners and uh, administrators and that completely uh, puts the ministry and uh, implementing officers in a bit of uh, a tight position to act on that. So it's a case of government shooting itself in the foot. Yeah, we, we have had that narrative for a long time. Mm. Some even arguing that some of these companies are owned by the ministry officials themselves. Yeah. But, uh, but no, there is no one in this country who is above the law. Whether a general, in fact, you'd be surprised that those powerful people, their companies are more clean because they, they fear to the so-called powerful people. They fear their names to come in this repute. So no one is above the law. And there is no law that stops powerful people from starting business anyway. Mm -hmm. So what, what matters is that everyone is accountable and they operate within the laws of the land. So the ministry has capacity to bring to order or sanction any company irrespective of who owns it. And we have done so. We have suspended licenses of companies. We have revoked licenses of companies and so on. So oh. ownership of companies cannot mm. deter them from being sanctioned. No one is above the law in this country. Influence peddling is the issue. The ability for one person, for example, to avoid or even avert the authorities on a, a key issue that is required, especially when it comes to the streamlining of uh, the labor. Now, I know the Ministry of Gender, uh, Labor and uh, Social Development is in uh, a spot of bother. I earlier spoke about the fact that a nation should not be exporting its people at the rate at which Uganda does. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody can explain it away and uh, speak about the statistics, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to the finances. The $700 million coming in uh, into Uganda, somebody can say that is justification. I insist it's not. The ministry must have a strategy of rethinking how to retain Uganda's very very much needed uh, human capital so that they can be able to build the nation. What is the strategy there? Yeah, of course, uh, the long-term strategy at government level should be to create employment within the country. How mm. do you create employment? Encouraging investments in the country. You have production, you know, factories grow where you have one factory employing over 4,000 people, 5,000 people. But now we are in a country we have less, there is less production. There is no way you can create 
uh, employment, if you have less production, you have few factories. Mm. Like if you do a survey around you, you know, this town, the top 10 rich people in this country, are they in manufacturing? You will be shocked, majority are in real estate. How many employment opportunities does real estate create? So if a big percentage of your rich people are in real estate, then it means there is less employment opportunities being created. Mm. So it's not means of gender to create jobs, but government generally mm. has to provide a conducive environment for investment so that we have uh, a lot of production where people can be employed. Then also agriculture sector can also employ people but there is this tendency of people thinking agriculture is maybe for the non-educated or less educated or, or rural people. So we have also to change mindset. Mindset change. People, some people say learn to go to abroad to work mm. instead of... Cultivate. Yeah, very many cases. Sometimes so it's, it's, it's a, national, a national responsibility that mm. we create investment opportunities, factories, a good investment climate, we get factories, production increases, people are employed, agriculture is at maximum, we have a lot of arable land for cultivation. We do we go away from subsistence farming, go to commercial farming. With all that there will not be need for people to go abroad for jobs. Okay. Now in this discussion I don't want to uh push anything under <laughs> the carpet. Many people are looking at labor externalization. But the word externalization alone uh, speaks of the opposite. Uh, so many, this is something you might not be readily, uh, com it, it might not be convenient enough to talk about, but Ugandans are concerned about the fact that there are people who are coming into the country and taking on the jobs that ultimately the situation is forcing them to go and seek jobs elsewhere. I don't know whether the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development has a mechanism of saving who comes into the country, especially with regard to the non-skilled <coughs> or semi-skilled individuals. You find, and I'll be very specific about this, you find an Indian, not of Ugandan descent, but an Indian of, well, <laughs> Indian descent, mm -hmm. a Chinese, a Vietnamese coming on board and then taking on jobs that ideally Ugandans think they should be readily available to them. That is a push factor for many of the young men to be able to seek to go abroad. Is that something that has been identified as it is and solutions being sought to that effect? Of course, to give a disclaimer, uh, <laughs> it's not the responsibility of, of the, the Ministry of Labor. Work for to mm. control the people coming into this country. Labor in the country? Labor the Minister the of Labor is not? Yes, it's, it's, it's not. Who, what, whose responsibility is that? I think it's, it's, it's Minister of Internal Affairs, uh, because they issue the work permits and so on. Mm. But we, uh, at government level, it's also a concern. Mm. There have been engagements yeah. uh, where also the Ministry wants, because we know that we have, we know the labor market, uh, we control the market, labor market information systems, so that we also have in an input on who should get uh, a work permit. S for instance, there should be job categories who sh which should be reserved for Ugandans and so on and so on. But largely, I think the problem of uh, non-skilled uh, labor coming into the country is, mm. is a national problem of enforcement of laws. Okay. We have laws, but perhaps the enforcement is lacking. If you have traveled to other countries, it's very difficult for one to, to enter a country and start working any other country but here uganda somehow I if you do research you find it's very easy for a foreigner to come into this country start yeah, right. living and working which is not the case with other countries even in within the east african region mm -hmm. so it's uh, largely an enforcement each okay. issue uh, which i think government is handling and should be able to And come. we have laws uh, of how people should come in and, okay. uh, and join the labor market. Mr. Hilary Talema, the head of labor externalization in the Ministry of Gender, Labor and uh, Social Development. Uh, many thanks for the perspective.
and of course uh, agreeing to be put on the spot especially on that uh, very last issue that you put a disclaimer to that means it is my duty and the producers to ensure that we put those questions to the gentlemen and ladies that are supposed to be able to answer them so that the Ugandans who are feeling constrained by the fact that other people are coming and taking over jobs they ought to be assured of uh, should be addressed that will do it for our Kickstarter uh, discussion and indeed a morning at NTV this fifth day of April uh, 2023 on behalf of the entire team that ensures there is a smooth flow right from 6 30 to 9 o'clock when we bring you news comment analysis lifestyle and of course sports many thanks for a job well done I'm Chris Higeni and on behalf of the entire team have yourselves a lovely day <laughs>